He recognized the humanity of the man he put on the cross. And what humanity does is it causes me to recognize that you and I have a lot more in common than I want to admit. That there is a common humanity that binds us. It's easy to put people on a cross if you deny their humanity. But recognizing humanity causes you to recognize that we have more in common than we do in difference. And what the church, the body of God needs, Christ needs, are more people who rather than drawing lines in the sand, draw circles of commonality. Can I say that again? That rather than drawing a line in the sand, here's you, here's me, let's draw a circle of commonality and recognize that our humanity binds us together.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made. Did you come to rejoice? Are you glad in it? Come on, raise your hands and let's exalt the Lord this morning. For our God is good and he's worthy to be praised. I said our God is good and he's worthy to be praised. Come on, people in the balcony. Our God is good and he's worthy to be praised. Anybody on my left or my right, do you know that God is good and he's worthy to be praised? Problems of 
This morning we're reaching back with a song that just simply says, Yes, Lord. How many of you know before you even let your feet touch the ground, sometimes you just got to say, Lord, I agree with you. And we just say yes this morning. Anybody say yes to God? Come on. When we say yes, we come in agreement with everything he has. We say no to our plan and we get in step with his plan. Anybody got a yes in your spirit this morning? Come on, let's say it this morning. Yes, I know Jesus. 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 Yes, I know Jesus.
just what he said. for ourselves we have decided to enter into God's gates with thanksgiving and to even now come into God's courts with praise we are thankful unto him and we bless his name even now family as we continue into worship let us turn our attention to our scripture which can be found in Micah the sixth chapter verses six through eight this prophetic pericope reads as such. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before the Almighty with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. God has told you, O oh mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Family, as we continue in worship, we now prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. We lift up those who are traversing the valley of the shadow of death. We lift up Gwendolyn and Anthony Adams in the passing of their mother, Gertie Thompson. We lift up Teddy Taylor in the passing of his wife, Antoinette Corbin Taylor. We lift up Kenya Gregory the passing of her father, Louis Gregory, and family both in the sanctuary and online. We invite you to lift up those names of your friends and family that you would like for us to lift in prayer. Let us pray. 
God who was, the almighty God who is, and to the eternal God who always will be. It is to you that we come with bowed heads and humbled hearts, full of gratitude. We're grateful for your love and for your mercy. We thank, we're thankful, O oh God, that you have been faithful to us, even when our steps and decisions have shown to be faithless to you. We thank you. We thank you for being our deliverer. We thank you for redeeming us from the stain of sin. In this moment of gratitude, oh God, we as a faith community come together to lift those who are experiencing bereavement now. God, we know you to be a tear wiper. We know you to be one who will hold us late in the midnight hour. We know you to be a God that can keep us before, during, and after the casket has been opened and closed. So God, we lean on you. We put our faith and our trust in you. We lift up that sister and that brother. We ask God that you would give them the peace, only peace that you can give that surpasses all understanding, that surpasses all misunderstandings, that even surpasses our unanswered questions. Thank you for that peace. And God, now, as we continue into this worship service, our prayer is simple this morning. God, have your way. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Bless your manservant now. Strengthen him now. We thank you for clarity of speech and thought as he delivers your word to your people. Be with us now and forever. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. Every heart and mouth said amen. amen. Family, as we continue into worship, we ask that you would lift your voices and your hearts as we join with Trinity with the hymn of rejoicing, Lift Him Up.
Beloved, as we continue to lift up the Savior, let us pass the peace of Christ with one another. Morning, Alfred Street. To those who worship with us in this our sacred space that we call sanctuary, both here and in overflow, to our family and friends connect through the Holy Spirit and the gift of technology and join us online. Grace and peace be unto each and every one of you from God who loves us as a mother and a father, and Jesus Christ, who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning redeemer. Fall is in the air. And this is another beautiful day that the Lord has made. And give us the opportunity on this Lord's Day. If you're glad to be in church today, would you just let the Lord know it as we give thanks for this privilege. Do me a favor, nudge somebody next to you, tell them I'm glad to see you in church. You ain't been here in a long time. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Last week, we found out that the Apostle Paul believed that as long as you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, that faith can guide you through any situation of life. If Christ can die and rise again, you know that death is not the end. You know that God is able to do all things. You know that looks bad on Friday can look a whole lot better by Sunday. That if you trust God, that God will always work things out. Somebody today, that's why you need to share in the breaking of bread and cup with us because it is our reminder that we believe Christ died and rose again. We celebrate an open communion at Alpha Street, which means as long as you believe that Christ died and rose, we invite you to this moment regardless of denomination and background. Prayerfully, when you came in, you received the elements of the Lord's Supper. If you did not, just wave a hand. There are deacons who are glad to serve you. As they're doing so, we invite our online family to join us by also taking hold of bread and cup, whatever you would use to symbolize the body and blood of Jesus, that together you might join in this sacred moment with us as we make our open confession that Christ died and rose again. The bread that we eat represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is our Christ. He was crucified and he died. He resurrected on the third day. He showed himself to his followers. He ascended into heaven. He is right now sitting at the right hand of God, making intercessions for our sins, and one day to the glory of God, he is returning. 
This we confess and this we believe. Let us break bread and eat together. And this cup is the memorial of the blood shed on the cross of Calvary. The blood which cleanses us of our sins. In it is the offer of forgiveness that God extends to us and then commands that we extend to one another. If it is your intent to hold a grudge, put the cup down. If you're determined not to forgive someone who's not even asked for forgiveness, put the cup down. But in this, we make a commitment to offer to each other what God has offered to us. Let us drink together. Will you pray with me, family? God, we receive in faith what you offer in grace. The complete and absolute forgiveness of all of our sins. The joy of eternal security of our soul's salvation. The precious gift of the Holy Spirit to dwell within our hearts and minds, to lead us into a life that is pleasing in your sight. And the commandment we have now that we've experienced this love, to share it with others as we make more disciples. God, you've loved us. Teach us to love one another. You have forgiven us. May we seek to forgive each other. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our King and our coming Christ, our Messiah and our Lord. In his name we do pray, amen. amen. Families, we gather together today as we remember those who are bereaved to lift up those who struggle among us in prayer. I'm asking that you remember the family of Deacon Oliver Hutchinson. Deacon Hutchinson finished his battle with cancer on yesterday and now rest in glory. We remember his wife, Kathy, his family, and our church. For those that are old school at Alpha Street, you know that Hutch was one of the most laughable and enjoyable deacons you ever want to be around. He knew a whole lot more than scripture. <laughs> and he will be missed. Today we welcome the presence of God by beginning to welcome God's presence in our guests. We fully believe in Alpha Street that the Bible's right, that you ought to be careful how you treat new faces, because God may have just sent an angel that you're unaware of. There's some angels in Alpha Street today we call you guests. If you're a guest of our church family and you don't mind being recognized, would you just wave a hand in the air and allow us to welcome you? Alpha Street, help me thank God for all the hands that are raised today. Welcome. You know how we do at Alpha Street. If a hand was raised next to you, tap him on the shoulder and tell him, I got your tithe today. I got your tithe today. Welcome to Alpha Street. God's been good to us. There's some folk that know it even better because you're celebrating a birthday. If you have a recent birthday, God has blessed you with another year of life, and you know that it is of the Lord's mercies. You are not consumed. I'm going to ask all of our birthdays to stand, and Alpha Street, help me celebrate the gift of life in this place. All of our birthdays. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday. We celebrate God's grace on your life and pray that you are excited to be in worship today. God's in this place through the gift of love. There's no greater gift than love, especially that witness of spouses that are celebrating another year of marriage. If you're here today and you all are celebrating an anniversary, won't you stand and allow us to celebrate you as well? Please remain standing, all of our anniversaries. Please remain standing. All right. We, wait, wait, don't sit down. We call out years. Amen. We need to know. how We nosy like that. We just nosy. Uh, how many years are you all celebrating? Ten years ago on the office. Amen. And you all still together. Amen. Did you see what he just did? Man, I'm going to pray for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I know I'm going to pray for your wife because I know you got your hands full with that Omega, man. May God's richest blessings be upon your life in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All the way in the back here. How many years you all celebrating? All the way in the back. How many? Two. Congratulations. Amen. My sister, how many of y'all get together? 31. Congratulations. And how many of you all celebrating right here? One. From one all the way up, praise the Lord. Actually, help me thank God for God's presence and the gift of anniversary and love in this church family. Hey, very quickly, a reminder, we don't lift up an offering at Alfred Street. We believe that we are a mature congregation and someone passing a plate and taking time and all in worship is just not necessary. Because the end of the day, you've already decided in your heart if you're gonna obey God. We always encourage you to be prayerful, to be obedient, to use all the platforms that are available to you online to give the Lord's tithe and offering. Do it today if you're watching online, we encourage you to do so as well. You know what happens when you give, we use it to be a blessing to those in need and to make large and glorious the name of Jesus Christ. A few things that are happening that your tithing supports, I wanna let you know, number one, if you would join in with us next Sunday. Next Sunday we wanna do something different. Next Sunday we're calling it Praising in Pink. We're inviting you to find that pink in your closet as we come together in recognition of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so if you would join us in putting on your pink, Pretty in Pink on next Sunday. Pretty in Pink to join in with us. This Tuesday, Versus is kicking off again. We've got the competitions ready to go. We invite you to log on and watch us at 7 p.m. as we see the ministries compete to see who will be the champion of season three of our Bible trivia. Then also we'll let you know today at one o'clock, about an hour, so I gotta get us out of here, says Joyce, amen. Uh, tickets will be made available for our Christmas concert at the Kennedy Center. On December 5th, we're going back to the Kennedy Center to make glorious the birth of Jesus Christ with our guest artist Yolanda Adams this year. And so we invite you to grab your tickets as you can to join in with us. You all know, if you've been watching the news, that our world is plagued with violence yet again. Just went upstairs to find out that Israel has declared war. Um, and we know of the violence that plagues the Middle East. Many of us have been there and walked in places that are now subject to war and destruction. That is not only overseas, but we also deal with the violence here at home. Not only is this Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but it is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month that hidden secret war that so many people battle alone and try to keep up appearances to protect the image of family and are looking for help and assistance. Beloved, you never know who you're sitting next to in church. And today we want to lift up a very special prayer for the survivors, the escapees, those who've had to live in it, and even the perpetrators, that we invite God into the hearts of all who are touched with domestic violence. One of the ways we deal with this is to be open about its reality and to invite God into every home, every heart that's touched. I'm gonna ask Minister Otis to come and lead us in prayer and you can sit or you can stand with the symphony orchestra here. We're not gonna come to the altar but if you want to sit, you can. If you feel like standing, maybe in honor of someone you know whom this has touched, we invite you to do so as you get ready to pray. Come on, family, let's get in our places of prayer as Otis comes to lead us. Whether standing, sitting, or kneeling, let us pray. God of boundless love, God who is ever caring, ever strong, and ever present, it is to you that we pray this morning. First, we thank you for your grace and the many ways it is manifested in our lives. Thank you for life, health, and strength. Truthfully, circumstances may not be ideal in our lives, 
but our testimony today is that you've still been good even on our worst day and you've still been a keeper so we say thank you this morning we gather as a faith community to pray for family, friends and for Psalm self we pray for all women, men and children impacted by domestic violence we lament. We hurt with all of those who face abuse, mentally, physically, verbally, and emotionally, too often caused by those whom they've loved and trusted. God, as we pray, our hearts are thankful to you for those who found help those who have escaped and found a way out. And we pray for their continued healing and well-being. Then, oh God, we also stand in solidarity and we pray for our siblings who are still surviving and thriving domestic violence. We recognize and acknowledge that for some, it's not just that easy to leave. So today we pray for strength amidst the storm. For those who carry this weighted burden in silence and shame, we pray that your presence surrounds them now and always. Omniscient God, the one who promised never to leave or forsake us, be with them. Now our prayer today is that they will never feel alone as we, the body of Christ, stand with them in prayer and support. Your word declares in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Today we stand on your word and that promise, God be our help in trouble. Yes, some of us know you to be a God to get us out of trouble, but some of us need you while we're in trouble. God, be our help. Give courage and be a refuge. Grant us bravery and God, be a safe haven and a hiding place when the storms and complexities of life rage and rise even in the places we call home. God, may your divine love and peace rule in our homes and our lives. Help us as a faith community to be vigilant and aware of our surroundings. May we pay attention to friends and family and co-workers and even strangers that we may discharge our sacred responsibilities to provide help hope and relief and support when needed. God, send help from Zion as we pray for the availability of and access to effective resources. God of peace, attend to your children and let them always know that they are your beloved. It is in the sweet and precious name of Jesus the Christ that we pray. And everyone said amen.
That's why I come to Alfred Street. <laughs> How I enjoy the songs that connect themselves to scripture. And I want to thank Trinity and the Sanctified Symphony Orchestra for reminding us that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Kendell, if you can increase the volume in the monitors, I struggle with voice a little bit. I had to preach yesterday in Houston and need as much help as I can get this morning. Pray with me, family. God, we're grateful for another day and the blessing of the gift of your word, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We come today, O oh God, surrendering ourselves like clay in the potter's hand. Lord, if there be anything that was shaped in us that's not according to your will, May your word work it out right now. This we ask in the name of Jesus, the incarnate word. In his sake we do pray. Amen. Amen. For the past few weekends, not only have we been caught up in the excitement of celebrating our 15 years together as pastor and people, but we've taken some time to sermonically study on these Sundays what arguably are some of my favorite scriptures. I've been attempting in this series of pastor's picks to share with you some of the scriptures that have helped and held my life and my ministry together in times of crisis and confusion and contention. And not just to be selfish, but in hopes that the scriptures will do the same thing for you that they've done for me. We started this journey by walking in those spaces and places where all of us land where we're frustrated and it feels like God has forgotten us. It's there that we hear the words that were just sung by the choir. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Yeah. Then we looked at the times when it feels like the frustration of faith just ain't worth it. That all the drama, the politic, and the headaches that come along with righteousness 
and church membership may make you want to quit. And it's there that the Apostle Paul reminds us in Galatians 6 and 9, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Last week, the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 walked us in the inevitable and inescapable valley of the shadow of death that we all will walk through. And it's there that Paul reminds us to not sorrow and grieve as those who have no hope because we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Today, as we get into part four of this pastor's pick, I want to share with you a scripture that was instrumental in my maturation of ministry. Leslie, this is not a scripture that held me together. It's one that tore me apart. It's one that helped me by changing me. You find it recorded in all three synoptic gospels. You'll find it in Matthew 27 and in Luke 23. But today, as you stand, I would that you hear the reading of Matthew, Mark 15, beginning in verse 33, as Mark shares with us the same account that we read both in Matthew and in Luke. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 33. Wonder, Mark, excuse me, thank you. Mark 15. I don't know why I want to preach Matthew. Mark 15, <laughs> beginning in verse 33. I want to read out the New International Version and know that you'll be able to keep along. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lemi sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, they said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed. His last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And hang out in verse 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. When the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how Jesus died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. You may be seated. I just want to preach at the cross. At the cross. Anyone who knows me and has ever spent time with me has probably heard me fondly remember and openly reminisce on my formative years growing up in the Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, 10706 South Michigan on the south side of Chicago. I am a product of the Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. In 1972, I was birthed into Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. In 1974, I was dedicated at the altar of Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. At the age of six, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I was baptized in the waters of the pool at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. Every Sunday at my father's house, we got up and there was no doubt in our mind where we were going. <laughs> my dad didn't care how late you stayed up on Saturday night, because on Sunday morning, everybody in this house is going to Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. 
Y'all, and we didn't just go for Sunday worship like some of you know. We, we went to Sunday school. We went to morning worship. We stayed for afternoon service. And then at 6 p.m., we had something called BTU, Baptist Training Union, where you were taught to be a good Baptist at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. We didn't just go to church on Sunday. No, no, no. We went to church almost every day of the week because my parents made certain I was active and involved at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. I was in the Sunbeam Choir. I was in the Boy Scout Troop. I was an usher and even elevated to be a junior deacon all at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church church. Everything I started to understand about God was shaped by the preaching of the late Reverend Dr. L.R. Jackson, who was the pastor of the Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. My formative theology, my beginning doctrine, my understanding of God, my first lessons in the Bible all came at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. I am the product of Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. And Earl, every now and then I reflect on my years at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, and I wonder why we called it progressive. Because <laughs> there was nothing progressive about Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. There was no come as you are. At Lilydale Progressive, you came with your Sunday best on. And if not, the ushers who were armed <laughs> would turn you away at the door. At Lindell Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, guests didn't just wave a hand. No, no. If you were a guest at Lindell Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, you had to stand. Tell people your name, the church you went to, and to make sure you weren't lying, you better know the pastor. And if you didn't have a church, you better make one up, because the last thing you wanted to do was stand up and not have a church to name. At Lydell Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, if you were a teenage girl and you got pregnant, you not only had to step out of the choir, you had to stand in front of the church and confess your sins. Never saw the brothers stand, but the girls <laughs> always had to stand. At Lydell Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, you didn't just sit in worship. Over on, on, on the side here, there's a bench that didn't run parallel to all the others. It, it ran perpendicular, and it was called the mourner's bench. You know what the mourner's bench was? It's where your mama and your grandmama made you sit when they realized you were a sinner and you needed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so you sit on that mourner's bench, and everybody in church would look at you and knew you were a sinner. <laughs> Surrender part of the reason I got saved, because I wanted to get off. <laughs> that bench. At Little Del Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, women did not serve in leadership. Deacons were exclusively men. Never ordained a woman as a deacon at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. But that's why we had deaconess. Deaconess were the wives of the deacons, and they helped prepare the communion, and they sat behind the mother's board on the right, and the deacons sat down front on the left. That, that was progressive. At Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, women did not preach. They weren't ordained. We didn't believe that women were called of God to declare God's holy word. I'll never forget one Sunday a visiting church came and an evangelist, a preacher from the other church was a woman and 
she got up to give remarks on behalf of the pastor, and she had the audacity to walk to the pulpit. And y'all would have thought Jesus came and we missed it because all <laughs> hell broke loose when she grabbed the microphone at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. Queer? There's a queer presence at Lilydale, but that's not the word we were using. We were raised with language that I'm ashamed to admit we used. There were gay men at Lilydale Progressive, but the only safe place for them was in the choir and then in the closet. I sometimes wonder how we got the name Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. And then I finally figured it out. We got our name the same way most Baptist churches get their name after a fight or a split. When a Baptist church splits, the group who lost or got voted out or left, they tend to leave and they're petty. So they want to keep the name of the church but they add an adjective on it to let you know we're better than you. So, so, so if you are ever traveling and you see greater Mount Zion, <laughs> trust me, there's a Mount Zion somewhere <laughs> that got split and the petty folk named themselves greater Mount Zion. If you ever see new Mount Calvary, Trust me, there's an old Mount Calvary that those people left from. And I figured out, CJ, that we were called Lilydale Progressive because we left Lilydale. And if we were the progressive ones, I shudder to think what was going on at the old Lilydale. I am the product of Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, and I was raised with a theology that was anything but progressive. And the scary part, Dr. Joyce, I had all the scriptures needed to back it. I knew women didn't preach because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 that women ought to keep silent in the church. I knew Leviticus 17 said that if a man sleeps with a man the way a man sleeps with a woman, that's an abomination to the Lord. It was drilled in us that Deuteronomy 21 declared that fornicators ought to be stoned. I knew women didn't serve in leadership because 1 Timothy chapter 2 said that women should have no authority over men. Anthony, I was raised that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because the men were gay. And y'all, every first Sunday at a good Baptist church is communion Sunday. You didn't have communion like we did. You started communion by reading the Baptist covenant that was printed on the wall over there. Because you couldn't take communion until you went into covenant with them words with some old school saints, having been led as we believe to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and those assembled enter joyfully and willfully into covenant with one another. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk circumspectly in the world and to abstain from the sale and use of intoxicating drink as a beverage. That's what I was raised in. That's what I believed in. That's what I subscribed to. That's what I was taught. That's what I practiced. And now here I am. At Alfred Street Baptist Church, trying to be a steward 
of the 220 year history of this church. And my desire is to race all gender inequality. My desire is to level the playing field of leadership for both men and women. My desire is to tear down this hypocritical hierarchy of sin where the church says that sin is worse than this sin. My desire is to create an atmosphere and environment where queer is not embarrassed, but embraced with godly love and human dignity. A place where we realize we are not agents of God's wrath. We are messengers of God's mercy. And the focus of my preaching is not to condemn and put people in hell, but to show people the way to God by helping them experience and share the transformative love of Jesus Christ. I'm not where I was. And let me be honest with you, since you go to Alfred Street, I've paid the price for it. I've been banned from preaching in certain denominational circles. Colleagues, friends, and even some mentors have rejected and criticized me. Conservative preachers misquote and take bits and bites of sermons and put them online and call me a heretic and blasphemous. I have a mentor who once said to me, Howard, how did you stray so far from the way you were raised? Inherent in that question is the understanding that doctrine by nature is conservative. That the pictures and portraits of God we paint as children very rarely change. That it is easier to lock God in a box than it is to be open to experience something that causes you to change what you thought you knew about God. In a real sense, y'all, religion conditions us to invest more in the certainties of God than to embrace the mysteries of God. Let me say that again. It is easier to invest in what you think you are absolutely certain about God than it is to be open and embrace the mysteries of God. I have a pastor mentor who said to me, Howard, if it's new, it can't be true. And that's the way I was raised. That's what I believed. That's what I was taught. That's what I learned at Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. Until the moment I stood in the shoes of this centurion who Matthew, Luke, and Mark introduce us to at the cross of Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about centurions so we can get the meat of the message. Centurions were ranking officials in Roman army who had command of at least 100 soldiers. Becoming a centurion was really one of the highest goals of anyone in the Roman army, not simply because of prestige and privilege, but because Roman centurions made 17 times more than the average foot soldier. You didn't just become a centurion. It took 15 to 18 years rising through the ranks of enlisted men so that you could prove not only your efficiency and cap capability as a leader, but even more, your loyalty to Rome. Mm -hmm. To become a centurion, you had to ascribe to everything Rome said. 
Centurions were not just commanders, they were modern day master sergeants because their role was not simply to command, their role was to train other soldiers to be loyal and faithful to Roman rule and Roman legislation that you did not become a centurion until you believed it and made certain everyone underneath you believed the same thing. And this centurion we meet in the Synoptic Gospels, he is in charge of the security patrol and the execution squad that handled crucifixions in Jerusalem. His job, y'all, was to carry out the Roman order of capital state endorsed execution for thieves and insurgent troublemakers. He had committed his entire life to crucifying thieves and troublemakers. And what they did on that Friday in crucifying two thieves and a troublemaker in the middle was something they had done hundreds of times without pause. Because everything in them, everything he'd been trained, everything he believed, everything he'd been indoctrinated with told him that anyone Rome said goes on a cross deserves to die because they're nothing other than a thief and a troublemaker. And here is this centurion with everything he's believed and everything he's been taught and everything he's been trained in standing at the cross and saying words that could have cost him his life. This man was the son of God. I want to make certain you catch that this is not something he should have said. Everything he'd been trained taught him different. Everything he had been taught in Roman public schools taught him different. Everything he had heard at Roman altars taught him different. Everything he had read in Roman sacred scriptures taught him differently. Everything he learned at Roman progressive missionary Baptist church (laughs) said you should never make that kind of statement. And yet here he is, opening his mouth and sharing what is absolutely contradictory to what his Sunday school teacher taught him. This man was the son of God. Y'all, what made him change his perspective? What caused him to rethink everything he had been taught? What what caused him to stray so far from what he'd been raised in? What caused him to question Roman progressive missionary Baptist church doctrine? What led that brother to detach himself from everything he had heard and learned and start opening his mouth and saying stuff that could cost him his ministry. Could cost him his reputation in Baptist circles. Could cost him the name his father left him. What would cause someone to make a statement in contradiction to everything people taught you? The answer is simple. He stood at the cross. And at the cross, he saw some things that made him rethink everything he thought he knew. But beloved, what did he see at the cross? Listen, my job is not to make you think what I think. But please come stand at the cross and think with me for a moment. Let me share with you what this soldier sees that changes him. And it's the same thing that all the, if doesn't change you, at least challenge you. 
Can I tell you what he saw? Number one, he saw the suffering of Jesus. The Bible says that he saw how Jesus died. And in case you don't know, this crucifixion is a horrible way to die. Cicero, the Roman philosopher and politician, once said the crucifixion is the most horrible way for anyone to suffer and die. People who were crucified were first beaten, skin ripped off their back. Then they're forced to carry the cross beam of 120 pounds to the place of crucifixion where they are biologically, strategically nailed to a cross in places where Rome knew hypovolemia and asphyxia would set in. This is what happens on the cross. You slowly bleed to death. On the cross, you can't breathe. The cross was meant to cause as much pain as possible for as long as possible. And it's easy to ignore the suffering of someone crucified when you stand at a distance. But the minute you get close, you are exposed to a suffering and a pain that ought to change and challenge your perspective of the one who's a, who deserves that kind of suffering. Beloved, there is something wrong with you if you can be exposed to someone's suffering and it not change you. That, that's, that's why when you're driving and you get to that light and that homeless brother comes up to the car, that's why you turn your head. Because you know if you look him in the eye and you see what he's going through and you acknowledge his pain, it'll make you want to do something. Because if you got any Jesus in you, if you have any ethic in you, if you have any morality in you, if you have any humanity in you, when you see someone suffering, it ought to change you. can I see you in this? Y'all, this, this is what triggered a change in America. In 1955, Emmett Till was killed in Mississippi. And when his mutilated body was sent home to Chicago, his mother, Mamie Till, made a decision that would change this nation forever. The funeral home said, let us touch up his body. Let us cover up the bruises. Let us make him look better. And she said, no. The world needs to see what they did to my son. And Mamie Till allowed the mutilated body of her son to lay in an open casket at Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ, 50,000 people walked through and saw that mutilated body. They said people were passing out when they saw it. The news media covered it, and Jet Magazine put a picture of Emmett Till's mutilated body for the world to see. And when this nation saw the pain that Emmett Till had endured and the pain that his mother went through, it sparked the beginning of the civil rights movement. Because there's something about being exposed to someone suffering that ought to change something in you. You know what changed this centurion? that he got close, he saw the suffering of Jesus. And I believe he had to ask himself the most difficult question that people refuse to ask themselves. When you see the suffering of others, when you see the oppression of others, when you see the injustice done to others, he has to ask the question, what have I done? 
to put him on that cross? How am I complicit in his suffering? How have my affiliations aided and abetted the pain he's going through? How has my theology condoned her oppression? How does my reading of the Bible put people in hell when I should be there myself? How am I guilty? Beloved, if you don't walk away with anything else from this sermon, I want you to remember this question. How has my privilege caused or come at the cost of someone else's suffering? How has my privilege caused or come at the cost of someone else's suffering? And as long as you stand distant from the cross of the suffering of people, you will never have to ask yourself that question. That, Kim, is the problem I have with the opposition to critical race theory. That's the problem I have with the ignorance of burning books that tell the truth about America's evil, racist, slavery history. That's the problem I have with making it illegal to teach this generation about the suffering of slavery. Because you're raising a generation that can stand so distant from the cross of the slavery, uh, suffering of slavery that they detach themselves and think that their privilege has not come at any cost and therefore they have no responsibility to respond to what they cause. So you raise a generation who's so far removed and we can't show them the cross that they say things like, well, I never enslaved anybody. They say things like, that was so long ago, why don't you just get over it? It allows Texas officials to rename slavery as involuntary relocation. It allows ignorance to get on social media and say slavery benefited black. Let me tell you something. <laughs> slavery didn't benefit black people. It cost us millions of lives to which you are now walking in the privilege of my ancestors' blood and my ancestors' death and my ancestors' labor and my ancestors' suffering and my ancestors' violence and now you're privileged but because you stand far from the cross. When you stand too far from it, you don't acknowledge how you benefited from it. There's something about seeing suffering that ought to change you. Let me prove it to you. I had trouble sleeping just last night. So I got up, put the television on, tried to help me go back to sleep, and I realized commercials after 1 a.m. <laughs> are horrible things. <laughs> commercials after 1 a.m. do nothing more than try to get money from you. Because they figure you up at night, there's something wrong with you. Yo, let me tell you a commercial that I saw last night that deeply disturbed me. The American Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Animals. You already know it. That is not fair at 1 a.m. You're showing me pictures of emaciated, starving animals that people have been cruel to and beaten and they're shaking. Give that dog something to eat, please. <laughs> but there's a philosophy behind it. Because the ASPCA knows if we show you pictures of suffering animals, something inside you 
ought to say no dog should suffer like that. And you will reach in your pocket and you will give because you saw suffering. There's something wrong with you if you can see the suffering and it not make you want to do something. There's something wrong with the people who can see suffering and not make a change. There's something wrong with a nation that can watch suffering. And there's something wrong with you watching George Floyd murdered on the streets and come back telling me white lives matter too. There's something wrong if you can see tiny caskets after a school shooting and you not reaching your pocket to change gun reform, there's something wrong. If you can see suicide rates increase with queer and trans and you still want to sanctify homophobia in the church, there's something wrong. If you can watch the pain of a raped woman and not give her access to adequate health care, there's something wrong with you. How can you see the suffering and not be changed? How can I hear Teresa Fry Brown, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, with tears in her eyes, tell me the pain she experienced because she couldn't eulogize her mother because of the church they buried her mother in women could not preach. I can't see suffering and not be changed. Not only did he see the suffering, preach, Pastor, he, he heard the humanity of Jesus. What will change is not only when you see the suffering, but when you hear the humanity. The Bible says twice that when Jesus was on this cross, he cried out with a loud voice. The centurion not only sees it, he hears Jesus. Can I teach the Bible for a moment? The Bible says he cried out with a loud voice. That term loud voice in the original Greek that the New Testament is written in is this term megas phone. Megas phone, megas phone. You ought to hear the word megaphone. Now, the problem with your translation is that you think loud voice, megasphone, megaphone implies volume. It's not volume, it's clarity. To cry out with a loud voice does not mean it's louder. It just means it's clearer so that you understand the source from which it came. Okay, let, let me see if I can help you. One of the things that makes R&B such a powerful, dominant musical genre. Sister Joyce, say amen when I get it right. Um, one of the things that makes it so powerful is that R&B introduced into music what other musical genres had neglected called a bass line. That R&B is dominated with a heavy bass line. Now, the problem is, in most songs, there's a bass line, but you don't hear it. And what some rock and roll groups did to once again build off of what we created. Was they adopted the bass line. Let me give you a prime example. There's a group that adopted the bass line called Queen. You remember Queen? We will, we will rock you. We are the champions. In 1980, they released a song with a bass line that was popular. Ah, right. <laughs> uh, you all ain't saved. You ain't saved. You didn't know the words to lift him up, but you... <laughs> Let me tell you what Queen did. Queen megasphonated the bass line. 
They drowned out all the other sounds and made it clear so that when you heard the bass line, you knew where it was coming from. You knew the instrument that it came from. You knew that you heard the bass. That's what megas phone means. That's what the loud cry is. It's not that it was so much volume, but it was so clear that the Roman centurion heard it and knew it was coming from a man. So he says, this man was the son of God. He recognized the humanity of the man he put on the cross. And what humanity does is it causes me to recognize that you and I have a lot more in common than I want to admit. That there is a common humanity that binds us. It's easy to put people on a cross if you deny their humanity. But recognizing humanity causes you to recognize that we have more in common than we do in difference. And what the church, the body of God needs, Christ needs, are more people who rather than drawing lines in the sand, draw circles of commonality. Can I say that again? That rather than drawing a line in the sand, here's you, here's me, let's draw a circle of commonality and recognize that our humanity binds us together. If the Lord say the same in February, I want to, during Black History Month, preach a series on what I believe are some of the most prominent pieces of literature and oratory in African-American history. So we're going to look at Sojourner's Truth, Ain't I a Woman? I'm going to preach from Frederick Douglass, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Uh, we're, we're going to look at Fannie Lou Hamer in 1964, standing next to Malcolm X, saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, and I got to go to my favorite, my absolute favorite piece of African-American writing from Dr. Martin Luther King, Letter from a Birmingham Jail. For those who don't know, Letter from a Birmingham Jail is a letter Martin Luther King wrote to white clergy who were trying to distance themselves from the pain and suffering black folk felt in the South. And he was highly discouraged that these white clergy thought they weren't all in this together. So let me read you a little excerpt from Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham Jail. He says, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. All people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality that we are all human, and we are all tied in this together. And I cannot separate myself from you because you think differently or look differently or love differently or believe differently because we're all connected. All of us want some of the same things. I don't care what your color is. I don't care what pronoun you use. I don't care who you choose to love. I don't care what side you vote on. All of us want to be happy. All of us want to be living, living in peace. All of us want to raise our children and send them to school and know that they'll come home that night. All of us want to be able to pay our bills and have something left over to live off of and to leave to our children. All of us want to be loved and allowed to love who we choose to love. All of us want to be accepted for who we believe God created us to be. All of us want fair representation in our government. All of us want to hear God call and we be able to say yes. All of us want to sit in the sanctuary and not be judged all of us have our humanity in common who deserves to be told God doesn't love you who deserves to be told you can't serve here who deserves to be whispered about 
in sacred spaces. The failure to change comes when we fail to see our common humanity. When we distance ourselves from the suffering our privilege has caused. Let me give you the third thing, and you'll talk about it in Village this week. He saw the suffering, he heard the humanity, and then he discerned the divinity of Jesus. Watch what he says, y'all, I feel my help coming. He says, truly this man was the son of God. Now, if you're a Bible reader, this ain't the first time you've heard someone say, this is the son of God. If you read your Bible, Denzel, in chapter 1, verse 10 of Mark, they're down at the Jordan River. um, And Jesus comes about the water after being baptized. And the Bible says the heavens open. Um, and, and someone else says, this is my son. God declares it. In case you didn't get there, in chapter 9, verse 7, Jesus takes Peter and James and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and while they're there, Elijah and Moses show up, and they're getting ready to worship, and the heavens open, and the God who spoke in chapter 1 now speaks in chapter 9 and says, in case you missed it, in chapter 1, let me say it again, this is is my son and what the Roman centurion declares at the cross is in alignment to what God said at the Jordan what God declared on the Mount of Transfiguration the words out of his mouth are in alignment with what God has already declared okay you're slow you know what this means the centurion saw Jesus the same way God did You know what it calls you to change when you recognize how God sees whoever you call them. Because maybe you're treating them in a way that does not align with how God sees them. How does God see your them? Well, well, in case you're struggling and you're trying to turn to Leviticus this or Romans that or Exodus this or Deuteronomy that, if you're trying to find your scripture, let me give you the simple answer. You want to know how God sees them? The same way God sees you. The same way you are a sinner saved by grace. The same way mercy woke you up this morning. The same way Jesus died on the cross for you. The same way God made a way for you when you were not worthy. It's how God sees your them. And I know you're not going to like this, but if grace can find your rusty behind? If mercy can overlook your mistakes, if the love of God could change your life, if the church family helped you get back on your feet, then surely the same grace, the same mercy, the same love should be offered To them, Zena, the world would change if when we looked at people, before we saw whatever their them is, we saw God. We are all made in the image of God, and that does not need your approval or affirmation. How would I treat you if I saw God in you first? How would I treat you if I knew that my privilege caused you pain? How would I treat you if I recognized that we have more in common than we do in difference? How would I treat you if I saw God in you? Let me, let me get out of here. My, um, this was pressed on me the other day. 
dealing with Cooper. And just so you know, people always ask, Cooper's fine. He's glad his brother's gone. <laughs> um, I work out two, three times a week. Z and I, we go to the same gym. We don't tell people where it is, though. No, we don't tell people where it is. <laughs> you go to your gym. <laughs> you leave our gym alone. Um, and yeah, I work out with a trainer, because I'm trying to get him the best I can be. And so Cooper now wants to work out with a trainer, because he's in off season, so he wants to work with a trainer. And so I take him to the gym the other day for the first time. I've set up a, a meeting with a trainer, and he's going in for the first time to the gym to work out with the trainer. Um, I'm in the car, and I'm on a call, and I, I know if I go in the gym, I'm going to lose the call. So I tell him, go on in, and I'll be right there. Um, I'm going to finish the call. And then I realized, wait, wait, he's never been in the gym. He doesn't know who his trainer is. And the girl at the desk can sometimes be a little mean about you not having your key card. Um, I, I've gone, and you know who I am. I come here three times a week. You know, he just called me pastor. You know who I am, but you won't let me in because I don't have my key card. So, Anthony, now I'm worried because I sent Cooper in for the first time. She doesn't know him, and he doesn't have a key card, and I know she's going to be mean to him. So I hurry up and get off the phone, and then I go inside because I want to make certain that, that the girl at the desk ain't mean to my son because this is the first time working out, and she can sometimes be mean if you don't have a key card, even though she knows who you are because she knows who I am, and she won't let me in. So I'm rushing in because I don't want her to be mean to my son. And I come in, and Cooper's not there in the reception area. And I'm looking for him, and the girl at the, key, at the desk, who can sometimes be mean and not let you in because you ain't got a key card, even though she knows who I am, she heard someone call me Pastor West. You know I pastor Alpha Street Baptist Church. She doesn't let me in. She ain't going to let my son in. I come in, and Cooper's not there. He's going upstairs to work out already. I said, well, where's my son? She said, I let him in. I said, listen, you, you let Coop, Cooper is 6'1", black, got braided hair, and you let him in the gym, you didn't even ask for an ID card. You ask me for an ID card every time I come to this joint. You know daggone well I'm the pastor of Street Baptist Church, and you make me show an ID, and he's 6'1", got earrings on, got hair braided, and you let him in. You know what she said? I let him in because I looked at him, and I saw he looked like you. Because I could see his father in him, I realized I've got to treat him differently than I would treat someone else because I see his father in him. Stop being mean to folk when you see God at work in their lives. Do me a favor, nudge somebody, tell them I see God in you. Let's go, let's go to Sunday school. What changed me? I saw the suffering that my doctrine and my beliefs and my maleness had caused people. I heard the humanity and realized we've got more in common. I began to see God at work in people. When you see the suffering, when you hear the humanity, when you discern the divinity, it will cause you to love. And the thing that's most difficult for people to accept about what I'm trying to do is that they don't understand love. So we're going to finish this series next week I'm going to invite you to another powerful passage, one that says, anyone who says they love God and have not loved their brother and sister is a liar. Come back next week if God graces us. We'll preach the subject, what's love got to do with it? God, I thank you for bringing us to the cross where we can acknowledge the suffering where we can hear the humanity and where we can discern the divinity. 
God made that change and challenge us in how we treat those who come into our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Family, we're getting ready to leave this place. Two things. One, please don't forget, although we don't raise an offering, that doesn't mean we're not dependent upon it. We need you to help us to continue to make glorious the name of Jesus Christ, to do the missionary work God has called us to do. You know what happens when you give. Hungry bellies are blessed. Children are encouraged and equipped to go to school. You know what we do. I'm asking you to be faithful. If you're here today and you desire to know more about how God sees you and what it means to belong to this place, you need to go online and fill out that form if you're watching us, or you can stop here at the altar on your way out and touch the shoulder of a deacon who'll be glad to welcome and receive you into this body of Christ. Let's leave now on the voices of Trinity as we get ready to go and change the world. family and now family to the almighty the all wise the eternal the sovereign the faithful and omnipotent God who alone is creator of heaven and earth to the God that has made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus who always and alone is our Christ our loving Lord our sacrificial Savior our resurrected risen reigning returning Redeemer to the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay, through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that the wise God be both glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord, who loved the Lord, who stood at the cross and awaited his return, said amen. amen. <laughs>
Welcome to Alfred Street's online worship experience. Now here are the upcoming announcements for this week. We know that these are difficult and challenging times. We invite you to stay connected by participating in our online worship services and remain faithful in your giving online via our Alfred Street website, ASBC app, and on our text messaging system. If you have any questions about giving, please feel free to email our finance department at finance at alfredstreet.org. If you're interested in becoming a member of the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church, please email deacons with an S at alfredstreet.org or complete the membership form on our website or on our ASBC app. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Alfred Street would like everyone to wear pink every Sunday throughout the month of October. Join us as we empower women to share their survival testimonies and encourage women of color to get an annual breast exam. Remember to think pink. Alfred Street would also like to remind everyone that October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. For nearly three decades, Domestic Violence Awareness Month has been observed nationally in the month of October as an opportunity to bring attention to the issue of domestic violence and its effect on victims, survivors, families, and our communities. Be sure to visit alfredstreet.org for additional information, phone numbers, and resources regarding domestic violence. Are you looking for an incredible opportunity to share your musical talents? If so, look no further. Alfred Street Sanctified Symphony Orchestra is thrilled to announce that they are recruiting talented musicians like you to join their harmonious family. They're calling for all musicians to join them every Friday evening from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Send an email to sanctifiedsymphony at alfredstreet.org if interested. They can't wait to welcome you into the Alfred Street Baptist Church Sanctified Symphony Orchestra. We invite everyone to tune in via YouTube on the next episode of Verses on Tuesday, October 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Verses is the Bible-based trivia game show produced by Alfred Street Baptist Church. In this new exciting episode of Verses, we'll see our village team compete against our greeters and ushers. You don't want to miss it as these two teams battle it out with the ultimate goal of moving up in the rankings, all for the grand title of 2023 Versus Champion. Who will make it to the semifinals? You'll have to tune into our YouTube and Facebook Live page this Tuesday at 7 p.m. to find out who will be one step closer to winning the title. Hey, Alfred Street. Versus is back in stock. Our Versus team has been working around the clock to create another batch of our popular Versus Bible-based trivia card game, and they're now available for purchase. That's right. Purchase your set of Versus cards today before we sell out again. Visit our website or ASBC app and be the first to get your hands on Versus, a Bible-based trivia game by Alfred Street Baptist Church. Alfred Street family and friends, are you ready to say yes to no debt? If so, starting Thursday, October 12th through November 16th, you can register to participate in a six-week course entitled Journey to Financial Freedom. The classes meet weekly and virtually from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. You'll learn how to manage your life as well as how to use your money to reach your financial goals. Email financialfreedom at alfredstreet.org for details. Calling all ASBC entrepreneurs. Join the entrepreneurship ministry as they celebrate the 20th anniversary of Cybersecurity Awareness Month with the presentation entitled Who's Who? Cybersecurity Awareness for Entrepreneurs. All entrepreneurs are encouraged to register online and join us virtually via Zoom on Saturday, October 14th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. You'll learn how to keep your business and family safe in the face of all of the cybersecurity challenges that are evolving daily. Be sure to register online now for the Saturday, October 14th session. You'll receive the Zoom info on the day of the event. Email entrepreneurship at alfredstreet.org for details. Alfred Street Baptist Church family, join us in welcoming the newly appointed Deacons Class of 2023 at our in-person and or live stream Deacons Ordination Worship Experience on Saturday, October 14th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time in the Sanctuary at Alfred Street Baptist Church. Please come out and meet us in person as we congratulate our new deacons on the completion of their Alfred Street Baptist Church Deacons in Training Program for the Class of 2023. We look forward to seeing you there. Alfred Street Baptist Church, 
In recognition of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the Legal Resources and Beauty for Ashes Ministries present the 2023 Family and Domestic Violence Law Clinic. We invite everyone to register online and join us virtually via Zoom on Saturday, October 21st at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. If you want to know how the law can help you go from victim to survivor, or perhaps you're going through a divorce or child custody battle, then it's time to register online for this session. This is an opportunity to receive the answers to your domestic violence and family law questions from expert DMV attorneys. Register today for Saturday, October 21st to receive the Zoom info so you can participate. Email legalresources at alfredstreet.org for details or any questions. CLE credits are available for Virginia licensed attorneys. Calling all Alfred Street runners, walkers, and strollers. It's always great to be outside and back at it again. The Sports Ministry presents our annual Faith 5K and Christian Walk. We'll gather and depart from the George Washington Middle School in Alexandria on Saturday, October 21st at 7 a.m. Please visit the Alpha Street Baptist Church website to register today, and you'll also be able to purchase your T-shirt and merchandise from the upcoming Faith 5K. All merch will be shipped directly to your location. Let's prepare to run, walk, and fellowship together. The sports ministry is excited to return for the annual Faith 5K and Christian Walk and look forward to seeing everyone there. Attention Alfred Street members only. Can you believe that we're approaching the end of the year? So you know what that means. Our world-renowned music and worship arts ministry under the executive direction of our own award-winning director, Dr. Joyce Garrett presents Do You Hear What I Hear? A Christmas celebration featuring four-time Grammy and 16-time stellar award-winning gospel and contemporary singer, songwriter, and author Yolanda Adams, returning as our artistic director and conductor for the 13th consecutive year will be Mr. Theodore Thorpe the third. This promises to be one of our greatest musical celebrations yet, featuring a plethora of local and national artists, as well as our own Alfred Street Celebration Choir. That's right, we're back with a live, in-person musical experience at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts Concert Hall in Washington, D.C. On Tuesday, December 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You don't want to miss this celebration. Tickets are available now. Today, Sunday, October 10th through October 21st, for members of Alfred Street Baptist Church only. This event will surely sell out, so ASBC members, please, please, purchase your tickets today before they go on sale to the general public. Prices range from $40 and up, based on your seat preference. Please note that your ASBC membership will be verified. Members that cannot be verified will have their sales returned. Visit the Alfred Street Baptist Church website to get your tickets now. Attention all active Alpha Street members only. Please note that our next virtual Zoom church council meeting will be held on Wednesday, October 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Online registration is now open for this virtual church council meeting. However, you must be an active member of Alfred Street Baptist Church who has received the right hand of fellowship in order to participate virtually. The deadline to register is Tuesday, October 10th at 12 p.m. noon Eastern Time. Once you have registered, you will receive the Zoom link on Wednesday, October 11th, the same day of the meeting. Please remember to check your junk or spam folders for the Zoom link if you don't see it in your email inbox. Alfred Street Baptist Church, in conjunction with our Office of Christian Care and Counseling and Mental Health and the Sacred Sanctuary, present Diagnosed the Play, written by Mrs. Ayana Blake. ASBC Sanctuary Live In-Person Experience, Saturday, October 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, in person in the sanctuary at Alfred Street Baptist Church. Doors open at 6 p.m. Please be advised, this production contains material of suicide, sexual assault, depression, and other references of mental health disorders that may act as triggers. Diagnosed is intended for mature audiences only. This play is free to attend. Please invite your family and friends to come out to Alfred Street Baptist Church on Saturday, October 21st at 7 p.m. 
We want to cordially invite everyone to the retirement luncheon and celebration for our own beloved Reverend Edward Jackson. Reverend Jackson's unwavering commitment and dedication to Alfred Street Baptist Church is unprecedented. On Saturday, October 28th at 12 p.m. noon, Alfred Street will honor Reverend Jackson during an in-person luncheon at the Renaissance Hotel in Arlington, Virginia. We are so blessed and grateful to have Reverend Jackson for his faithfulness in serving here at Alfred Street Baptist Church. Tickets for the luncheon will go on sale this week via the Alfred Street website. Space is limited, so be sure to purchase your tickets as soon as possible. Alfred Street family and friends, registration is now open for our 2023 HVCU College Festival. That's right, Alfred Street Baptist Church in conjunction with our Alfred Street Baptist Church Foundation present one of the largest HBCU college festivals in the country. We're inviting all high school seniors and juniors across the nation, and especially in the DMV, along with their parents and grandparents, to join us in person and online. You don't want to miss this opportunity to register today for one of the amazing HBCU college festivals in the nation. It all goes down on Friday, November 17th, virtually and in person on Saturday, November 18th at the St. James Sports Complex in Springfield, Virginia. Be sure to visit our AlfredStreet.org website for details and all things pertaining to the HBCU College Festival. Alfred Street's Office of Christian Care and Counseling, in conjunction with our Divorce Care Ministry, present their fall sessions virtually every Thursday starting at 12 p.m. noon through 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. These sessions will continue through December 21st. Email divorcecare at alfredstreet.org. Alfred Street's Office of Christian Care and Counseling, in conjunction with our Grief Share Ministry, present their fall sessions virtually every Thursday starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time through December 21st. Visit our website to register and for any additional information. You can also email griefshare at alfredstreet.org for details. Our Faith Savage Gun tutorial ministry has a new home online. Communicate, learn, and stay informed all in one place. Visit our new webpage and check us out today at alfredstreet.org. Email tutorial at alfredstreet.org for details. Our Office of Christian Care and Counseling presents our hybrid, the Chronic Pain Support Group, facilitated by Mr. Jorge Wallace. This is a weekly support group designed to aid in the recovery needed from the emotional and spiritual debilitation of chronic pain and chronic illness. Recovery is defined as the ability to live peacefully, joyfully, and comfortably with ourselves and others. Chronic Pain Anonymous is a worldwide fellowship of individuals that understand the isolation, fear, and despair many have experienced when living with unpredictable and life-changing chronic illness and chronic pain. This support group will occur every Wednesday through December 20th. Email pastoralcounseling at alfredstreet.org for details. Our ASBC Village Study Guide is now available on the website to download. Be sure to check out a copy if you want to go deeper with Pastor Wesley's sermon prepared for you by the Villages of Alfred Street team. The guide is available online at alfredstreet.org. We invite everyone to join us for daily prayer call at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. Join us in prayer and praise Monday through Friday only by dialing 425-436-6277 access code 246114 pound sign again that's 425-436-6277 access code 246114 pound sign our new prayer line number will accommodate up to 2,000 participants however once we reach capacity we will continue to offer the playback option call our playback number anytime after 7 30 a.m eastern time each day monday through friday and you'll be able to replay the prayer call that you missed. To reach the playback line, please dial 425-436-6278 and enter the access code 246114 pound sign. Please note that this is not a toll-free number and therefore depending on your phone carrier, rates may apply. Hey Alfred Street family and friends, are you visiting us for the very first time or perhaps you're new to Alfred Street and you want to stay connected to us or receive the latest Alfred Street updates via text. If so, all visitors text the word visitors with an S to our new direct text number 571-977-4525. That's 571-977-4525. 
Also, we invite you to tune in to our Faith Forward weekly radio broadcast featuring Pastor Howard John Wesley every Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Magic 102.3 FM and 92.7 FM for a powerful sermon that will move you forward in your faith. For more information on these and all the exciting events taking place here at Alfred Street, please log on to alfredstreet.org.